welcome to the very first episode of Select Characters, a gaming podcast loosely associated with the True Gaming subreddit over at reddit.com. Uh, join us, we have a lot of good conversations and discussions about what games are, who games are, why games are, where games are, just games in general. Uh, what we're going to do in this podcast is we're going to talk about video games. We're going to talk about the implications they have on, on our lives, on our culture, and we're going to be talking about game mechanics. And to do that, I've got two willing accomplices with me here today. I've got Samuel, who's a board game enthusiast, and I've got Enrique, who uh, works at a gaming startup and who is a games journalist. Hi, guys. Hey, Chris. How's it going? Oh, yeah. How are you doing? Just fine. Just fine. All right. Doing good. Happy to be here. Yeah. You're looking forward to it? Very much. <laughs> All right, then. So today we've got a couple of uh, topics coming up and we're going to be a bit topical. We won't be doing that too often. Like, It's not really... Uh, our plan to do new stuff too often but every now and then something will pop up and we will want to discuss it so today we've got open worlds um we want to talk about multiplayer and asymmetrical multiplayer and paid mods because yeah that's been a been a subject of much contention over the past week so that uh, all, all of that and maybe more is coming up right about now all right, um, so because every gaming podcast does this, uh, and we, we are a gaming podcast, so we might as well do it, um, I want to talk about what we have been playing over the past week or so, and I'm going to start off by pl uh, saying that I finally bought GTA V on PC. I, um, Woo. yes, I, uh, I played it on the PS3. It was, it was a great game then, but it's even better now. I mean, the graphics are fantastic. Uh, it's a solid 60 FPS on even my system, which is not the best system out there. It, 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 it's just a really good good game. The world's amazing. The characters are really well thought out. Uh, the radio stations this time around are better than ever, I think. Especially the um, the chat radio shows. They're, they're absolutely oh, amazing. Oh, those are great, yeah. Yeah, uh, I think Laszlo does them. He, he, he does most of the... Um, of the dialogue, he writes most of the dialogue. He has been doing that for years now, and he and he's so good at it. And it's even fun, uh, funnier now that he's an actual character within uh, the world. You actually meet him at some point, and he is just a, a a great version of himself. Really, it's it's such a good game. I'm uh, I'm glad it's out on PC. I'm kind of glad that it's not just a port, which was I think something a lot of people were afraid of. Yeah, well, it it's not. It's got a wide array of options. I mean, you can tweak it to your heart's content, and it's been built from the ground up, I believe, and it really shows. It really shows. That's what I've been waiting for. I didn't play it on any of the consoles. I figured I'd hold out till PC, so my moment is coming. Yeah, um, I, I, I can I can really recommend this game. It, it's fantastic. It might be, I would even, yeah, I would even go as far as to say that it might be one of the best games of all time. Just the amount of detail in in the world and. In, in, in everything from from the music to um, to the way the cars look to the way that pedestrians react to your actions it, it it's amazing it's absolutely incredible awesome mm. so um who wants to go next yeah i'll jump in i suppose all right samuel i have been playing a little bit of ziggurat on the pc mm. and it's a procedurally generated first person shooter all right. where you are sort of a wizard who's trying to climb this tower or this ziggurat and every floor is kind of randomly generated and you have four weapons and three mana pools and you just sort of work your way through this roguelike like trying to get as high as you can before you die mm. and I realized that I am not cut out for FPS games like I used to be <laughs> I, I thought that this I would just sort of wanted to play something like that and it moves a lot like Quake 3 does with where kind of like one-to-one -one mouse movement and you can turn around extra super fast uh -uh. and I don't have the reflexes that I used to <laughs> but it's fun though still fun overall uh, is it That's is about. it free to play or uh, no it costs money uh, how much it's a it's a whole contained experience uh -oh. I, I was messing around with Tower of Guns a little bit which made me think like what other procedural first-person shooters can I find uh, I still need to play that I, it's free for PS Plus members at least in Europe so I, I, oh really? Yeah, I still need to get around to to playing Tower of Guns, but I've heard good things. Yeah, it's pretty groovy. All right, then. I like it a lot. Mm. All right, so Enrique, uh, sound off. Speaking of uh, roguelikes, I'm actually playing one by the name of Sunless Sea. Oh uh, yeah. 
It's kind of cool. It's like this gothic, you know, Victorian underworld kind of setting, and uh, you pilot a steamboat, and you basically, you know, travel around trying to. Uh, you have to manage crew, survival, terror, insanity, supplies. It's it's pretty neat. Um, mm -hmm. I'm at a point where my crew just turned to cannibalism, and we've been slowly eating each other, uh, just for the sake of getting. Like you do. Yeah, you know. <laughs> gotta do what you gotta do. But um, it's pretty. <laughs> How cool. would you compare it to FTL? Um, it's definitely more in-depth. Um, it's got a really, really fun story written by it, which is probably one of my favorite parts. Um, as fun as FTL is, the story's kind of lacking. You know, there's a lot of humor and just, like, the random events, but that's it. This has, uh, I guess, an overall narrative, and it gives you a couple different win scenarios, which is kind of neat. I think, uh, my motivation for my character is, uh, I want to write my masterpiece. So for that one, you, I basically travel around, um, completing all these little quests, and I can kind of collect... Mas I guess master stories from them and eventually I can come back home and I can retire and write my masterpiece But I have to have a certain amount of you know experience before I can do that. So it's kind of neat Oh, that's interesting. Is it tied to the character you pick or are you randomly? No, get yeah, no, it's a uh, you you get to pick a captain You know you get to design him a bit you pick like where he came from like where he or she came from You know what your motivations are or what your dreams are so it's it's a pretty interesting method and um They kind of warn you that your captain's gonna die because uh, it's you know, it's one of those hardest balls games So but it's pretty cool I, 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 love, I, love the I love the aesthetic. Yeah, that's actually what drew me to it. It's got that, you know, the whole Lovecraftian kind of feel to it, which is really, really fun. Yeah. Oh, wow. Sorry, sorry, Samuel, I interrupted you there. Oh, that's okay, man. I was just going to ask, did you carry anything over between playthroughs? Uh, not that I've seen yet. Um, I've actually been playing like a little bit of a chicken, I'm not going to lie. Just because uh, this is the kind of game where like my first playthrough, I try to stay alive as long as possible and just reading every nook and cranny, you know, um, I don't engage in combat unless I have to, so... But from what I've played, um, it's pretty neat. Yeah, I've always liked the, um, the ones where you don't carry things over between playthroughs. It feels a lot more true to the roguelike formula to me, where you start from scratch every time. Yeah, you start from, uh, like, you don't carry any supplies and stuff like that. It's just, you know, I think the only thing is you can learn some of, some of the events that you come across. That's about it. Mm, so, yeah, dead, dead is most definitely dead, man. Yeah, so I, I, I sort of like that. Like every time, every time you replay the game, where you have to re replay the game, it's sort of like a fresh start. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a too. lot of fun. Yeah, like you know, every time you start, like I said, you know, your captain dies, um, their story gets written, and then you just start picking new captain, new crew, and you go, for, you know, start from square one. But does the story actually change between characters? Because I, I, I it wouldn't be too, too stupid to believe that there's a finite amount of story. Well, it's it's weird. Like um, the story is changes depending on like what islands you visit and like what events kind of unfold so it's kind of neat mm. and it just it'll procedurally generate like you know where the islands are located what events happen on each island it kind of i guess depending on certain criteria you meet as you play the game it'll trigger certain events and scenarios to occur so it's it, it keeps pretty fresh all right then. man that looks cool yeah dude and yeah. like i said dude, it, it just looks neat because it's the whole like victorian cthulhu style mythos yeah the game looks absolutely fantastic so um anything else no, oh, that's the main thing. That and then, covers it. Yeah, I'm Monster Hunter, but that's like my, you know, my vice. Go to thing. Yeah. I've, I've been I've been playing um, a mobile game actually. Uh, it, it was on sale on the on the Google Play Store, and I just bought it. And it's a Rayman Fiesta run. Dude, yeah. the Rayman games are awesome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. I don't yeah, care what anybody says. Dude, they're too. just super fun. Yeah, like the the moment they they rebooted the franchise, you got um, Rayman Origins and Rayman Legends. Uh, it, the, the whole franchise came back to its former glory. It's fantastic, and Rayman Fiesta Run is amazing as well. It's really good, especially for a mobile game, and it's balls to the walls hard. It really yeah, is. Yeah, the first one I was really impressed with. Uh, Jungle Run, I think it was. Yeah, uh, Fiesta Run is actually better. It looks better. It, it plays better. It, it's just overall a, a more interesting game. Or, or, or yeah, a variance on, on the already established tropes, I think. You know, as much as I like those games that have a, you know, a deep story and, you know, cinematic graphics and everything like that, I there's always a place for just that really fun, brightly colored, simple gameplay. Yeah, sometimes you, you want to do away with the story and you just want to have fun. You want to be able to just pick it up and go and just let it go and and just you know put the controller down once you're actually done with it you don't really yeah, need to be experience. yeah exactly you don't really need to be in invested in 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 a fiesta run to actually enjoy it it's just great you pick it up play for a couple of minutes put it back down but every time that you do pick it up it's a lot of fun and it's really hard <laughs> nice stuff that you get is it a free to play one or do you have to buy it no you have to you have to buy it but it's like two or three dollars or something and it's peanuts compared to what you what you can actually do with the game because the game is 
It, it's not super, super long, but it's quite long for a mobile game. Oh, awesome. Sounds yeah, good so to me. It's definitely uh, definitely worth the couple of bucks it costs. So, yeah. Um, I think we've, uh, we've had this, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. On to the first topic. All right. Here's something we can talk about. Open worlds. What makes for a good open world? And can we name a few examples? Uh, I'll start this off because I was the one asking the question. I think an open world is good when the world feels like it's alive and it doesn't really need your involvement in order to progress or, or, or to evolve, uh, I, would, I would say. And I'm going to take the, uh, the example of GTA V because the world, it seems to exist with or without your involvement. And people seem to be going about their business, just cars going, going to and fro uh, uh, certain places. Uh, there's even entire parts of the map that are never really used for anything. Not for the story, there are no missions there, nothing. But they still are there. There's like, there's like a fully designed dam there. And you never go there, but it's still there. and just gives this... It, it gives the area like life, like it has a purpose. Like a sense of ver verisimilitude. Yeah, exactly. Like it, it, it gives it all a sense of place, I guess. Like, like it's an actual real life place and people go there, people work there, people live there. And you're just one of the people inside that world doing it, its own thing. And I think that that is a good open world because it, it feels alive, basically. Just like you're a visitor to a place that kind of already was there. Yeah, exactly. You, you, you've got... You, you, uh, Borderlands 2 has got an open world as well, but th that one doesn't really feel alive. It's more like of a theme park. You know, you spawn somewhere or you go to, to a specific place there and enemies will spawn and they will attack you. It doesn't really feel like those people actually live there. It's more like, oh, it's a, it's a nice locale. It's a nice backdrop to do your killing in, but it's <laughs> not really a world as such. Yeah, it's like a level of detail kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. That's weird. I'd almost say it doesn't necessarily have to be, like, alive. Because um, this is actually from another thread on Reddit from our games. Uh, they kind of discuss, like, what games, you know, you consider works of art. And um, the top one was Shadows of the Colossus. And for me, that was a perfect example of really good open world, even though there was nay, like, a living creature in that world. I think mm. it's just because they kind of give you this sense of you know exploration discovery where yeah you know you can climb the mountains you need to you can you know leave your horse behind you can go underwater you can swim you can you know it doesn't really stop you from exploring any particular area and it's so vast it's it's kind of like that you know the idea of man you see like that canyon over there i can go there and it really does make it feel yeah. you know very open and you know like, like you have like almost unlimited freedom yeah, I, I guess with Shadow of the Colossus, the sort of draw in that game is the loneliness, I guess. Because you are the only person there, and you've got this vast world you can, you can traverse to. Uh, I, I don't know, I, I played the game, but it didn't really feel alive. It's a, it's a good open world game, but I don't know. No, no, and I agree, it doesn't feel alive. Well, that's the yeah, difference, exactly. right? You're, you're talking about open versus interactive. In yeah, a way. Yeah. I, 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 I guess what I view as open worlds are, are also worlds that feel alive and immersive mm -hmm. in, in that it's active, that stuff happens and I don't really need to be a part of it in order for that to happen. Uh, see, for me, uh, when I think of an open world, I think more of a, I guess, a world where I feel that I'm not really limited in any scope. Mm. You could just... Uh, That's the clinical definition of open. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. The, does that mean that a game misses character when there is nothing in it except space? Well, and it's weird because, like, okay, you brought up Borderlands. You know, I don't personally consider Borderlands a good open world game, and mainly because of the way that it's sectioned off. Mm. Um, granted, you know, you can go back and forth to you know through different areas, but I guess for me, the fact that there's those checkpoints and zoning areas and quick travel, it. It almost feels like it takes away from the sense of openness that the world should have. You know, there's no consist consistency throughout. Yeah, it doesn't feel vast in, in any way, shape, or form. Like, like I said, it, it's just a backdrop. But you, you, can, you can go wherever you want, but in the end, it's still a backdrop. It doesn't really do anything besides that, but besides just being there, I guess. Yeah, like an overall level of, I don't know, like confinement, but not as far as range of motion, but confinement as far as what you can do while you're there yeah 
Yeah, exactly. So I don't know, man. I I'm not generally a fan of the open world games. I I like to have very clear objectives and things to do. And so you like so you like linearity. Yeah, I'm horrible at making my own fun. <laughs> I, are, are you like one of those people that when you're presented with like a vast, you know, area of choice, you just pick nothing? Oh, probably. Yeah. Or what I'm saying is, you know, you made this world. Now give me something to do in it because I want to, you know, I want to experience the the thing that you made. I don't really want to make my own terms about what I'm uh, supposed to yeah, do. Yeah, that, that, that reminds me, actually, because I could never get into Skyrim, right? I, I know it's right. a good game. I, I, I know it, objectively it's a pretty good game, buggy, but it's really good. But it's one of those games that I can't get into because one, the world is really vast. And two, there's too much to do. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. you, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I've been pl I'm playing oh, the absolutely. game for like an hour or something, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm out of the tutorial area where the dragon just sort of interferes with your, your head being chopped off. And you instantly get these all these quests and all these different waypoints on your map. And after a couple of hours, I just give up. It's like, I don't know what I'm supposed yeah. to be doing. I do agree with you on that. Even in that. I don't know. Like, Skyrim is one of those games I that think... kills the the completionist in me. Because, like mm. you said, you know, oh, gotcha. you take two steps and you trip over a rock, and then you open up your journal and you have 30 quests out of that like little incident. <laughs> and you're like, what the? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if Skyrim had no dungeons or caves, I probably wouldn't be able to tolerate that one. It would sort of irritate that little no-objective part of me, but those dungeons and caves are their own embedded objective. Mm. Just sort of understated, you know, like, can you get to the end of this thing you just mm. found? Well, I don't know, you know, let's find out. That stuff I can I can jam on. And pretty it's also good. it's a it's also like it's it's a it's a very pretty game and I, and it's a it, well, it's a beautiful open world but I don't think mm. it's a great open world game because nothing that you do is of any consequence like I I don't I don't think that there sh there should be a lot of consequences to what you do because again in in GTA that doesn't really happen but you're not really the center of attention in that game whereas in in Skyrim, you are the Dragonborn. You are the center of everything, and nobody really recognizes you out, out, outside of story characters. And uh, I don't know. So I guess let me ask you guys this: Have you all played Minecraft? Yes. What do you feel about Minecraft? No. Don't like it. I uh, hate it. I like it. Then what makes? Because Minecraft is it's one of those examples that Sam gave. You know, it's it's an open world game with no objective. Yeah. It just kind of drops you in the big the map and says, "You knock yourself out." Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's an interesting open world thing. That I think I think it's an interesting sandbox. But I, I'm not really concerned with the world itself, and I'm more concerned with building my own things. Which in this case means I'm, I'll be building castles until the cows come home, because mm -hmm. God knows I'm not capable of building anything else but castles. <laughs> and the cows got to live somewhere. Oh yes. <laughs> well, I guess yeah. that that makes me wonder about. Um, what do you guys consider a good open world versus a good sandbox? That's a good distinction, mm. isn't it? Well, Minecraft is a good sandbox. I think to a certain extent, extent Skyrim is also a very good sandbox. I think GTA's world, like both for uh, San Andreas as well, um, and GTA Five, I think those are really good open world games. I think five and four more so than than Vice City and San Andreas and and GTA Three. Well, I mean, but what makes it a sandbox versus what makes it an open world? Right. I think it's degree of interactivity, like how much you can move and change the things that exist in that open yeah. world, okay. I think is what sort of pushes it into sandbox territory. Yeah. If all you can do is, I don't know, maybe something like Just Cause 2, like that's a huge open world and you can change things and shoot people and blow stuff up, but you can't really grab individual blocks and build things mm -hmm. and change the the bedrock nature of that island itself yeah. so that would be more open world and less sandbox but you're right i think it's definitely something about the degree of interaction so th would you say like a, i guess a sandbox games have almost more of a sense of player agency versus open world i think so yeah absolutely yeah. because you can i mean build and change like if i go on a rampage in i don't know gta 5 or whatever if it, it essentially can reset back to the way mm -hmm. it was you know, you're not building skyscrapers, you can't tear down skyscrapers, you can't change things permanently in, in large sweeping ways. But it is an open world by the definition of, you know, it's 
the boundaries of where you can go are pushed way back. I don't know. I was trying. I mean, it is sandboxy in a way too. No, you know, the games can be both. Yeah. See, I, I was actually going to bring that up. I was trying to think of examples where you have, get a game that's an open world sandbox. I guess if that's this, if that's not too redundant. I suppose they kind of have to be by their nature yeah, in a you way. Can, you can still, you know, in open world games where you're not really concerned with building stuff, you can still fuck about with with the world itself. But it's to a lesser degree than in a, in a, in a true sandbox. I, I think I think the the games that have a small amount of player agency in an open world can be more considered like theme parks. I guess you can okay. see all the rides and do all, do all the things that that the game allows you to do. And sandboxes allow you to manipulate pretty much every facet of your experience through you know, player interaction. So I guess all sandbox games are no. I guess all open worlds are are sandboxes, but not all sandboxes are open world. Take for instance Gary's Mod. Which is a sandbox, not an open world. But I might, but I might be stretching this too far by saying that. Actually, no, I think that I think that works. Mm. Actually, oh look at that! <laughs> In fact, I actually yeah. have a point. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's like a sandbox where you bring your own bucket and pail. So. Yeah, it's like the worst, and your own sand. In a, in a way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yeah. You know, good open world games to me allow me to be fully immersed in in the world fe feeling like i'm actually a part of that world not not the sole sole agent i guess just just one of the many other things in that world nothing special i think that 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 is what i'm looking for in a good open world game which is why i'm also sort of looking forward to the witcher 3 i guess Oh god, I can't wait for that game. Yeah, because um, looks pretty because good. Because that is a, a living and breathing world, at least by the looks of it. Well, well, and um, this time around, they were actually heavily advertising that it's going to be more open world in comparison to the previous two. Because for anybody yeah. that's played the you know Witcher one and two, they're very linear in scope. Yeah. That yeah. That's granted, true. when you're in the area, I guess for whatever act of the game you're in, you know you have a good chunk of exploration you can do, but you know, for the most part, you're kind of on rails. You know, there's go to point A, complete this quest, go to point B. You can go back and forth between them, but you know, you're very limited to where you can go. So I'm really interested in seeing how they tackled what, you know, this version of open world for them. Yeah, I, I saw a couple of gameplay videos where they, go, where they walk through a city and then I don't know, go, go to, I don't know, wetlands or something like that. Yeah, uh, it, yeah it, it just felt alive it, like the city felt lived in uh, all the NPCs seemed to have a purpose and you know they, they seemed to be going somewhere seemed to be actually doing something they noted you but you weren't really important to them and that is what I think is important for an open world so you're just a part of that world you're even even if you are something special, you're not really something special in the eyes of most people who don't know who you are, which I think is good. Yeah, I think it, at least from what I've seen of The Witcher Three, it's got the open world stuff without being sandboxy. Yeah, and I think I'm really gonna like it. I think it's gonna be mm. awesome. So it's going to be another walking simulator. Yeah, what I'm realizing is, I think I like open world games just fine, but sandbox games are the ones that, with no clear objective, that I cannot. Uh, you, you, you don't like not being a drone, basically. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, when, like, you know, when I sit down to play a game, I think of it as the developer setting it in front of me and saying, here's a puzzle, or here's a challenge, or here's a really cool story that I want to tell mm. you. I don't think of it like, let me take this thing and make my own story, my own puzzles, my own challenges. I want to go through somebody else's idea of an experience. Mm, well, well, maybe okay. the sandbox is the experience. Or maybe it is. I don't know. I just can't do it. Just cannot do it. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, there's there's no real, no, there's no good answer to this question. I I think it's just what you what you're looking for in in an open world, basically. If it, if it, what makes it good or or bad really depends on on you in the end. Well, it doesn't entirely come down to just size, does it? No, no, not necessarily. No, so being being yeah. free to go wherever you. You want to go like what? What? One of my favorite open world games was Spider Man Two on a GameCube, I think. Yeah, that's the one with the was it Enter the Shocker or Rise of the Shocker? I think so. I mean, you, you can just go around the city and do whatever you want, which I loved. I remember at one point I shot shot a web at a helicopter, mm -hmm. and I just zoomed around the city, just being strapped to the helicopter, and I dropped me <sighs> off at the Statue of Liberty, and that that was good. <laughs> I really liked that. I mean, that reminds, that reminds me of, uh, what is it, Ultimate Spider-Man. That one was a fun game. Yeah, that one, that one was all right. No, no it, it was, was fun. It's more than all right, okay? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry to, that I offended your sensibilities. <laughs> <laughs> 
You have, you offended his spider sense <laughs> abilities. <His> spider sensibilities. <laughs> Look at this guy over here trying to debate subjectivity. <laughs> no, but uh, no, I I think uh, you're right though. It, it's definitely more to do with like the actual I guess experience you get in the game rather than the size. Because if I remember, mm. the Shadow of the Colossus map is actually really it was relatively small compared to what we get now. And yeah. I mean personally for me, I consider that one of the best open world games that I've played. Mm. Which one? It was expansive. It was. Yeah, it was a I, good game. It, well, here's the thing though, because it's mostly in the city, right? So I, I don't know. I still, it still feels boxed in. What show the glasses? No, no, no. Um, Spider Man. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry. Should I should have made that clear. No, no, no not shout out the glasses. <laughs> uh, Spider Man, even though it was open world, it sort of I always felt boxed in. Yeah, but I mean, it's like, like it has to do with the scope, I think, too. Because even though mm. you know, with Spider Man or even GTA, like it's you're just one small character against this massive backdrop of you know other people, cars, cities. So yeah. Even though you feel boxed in, like you said, you know, you can latch onto a helicopter and you can really take in how small you really are in comparison. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's not even geographic, pure square footage. It's your how how you feel big it is, like your perceived square footage instead of the actual square footage. Mm. Well, there you go. <laughs> Uh, so the the next topic I thought we could bring to the table would be asymmetrical multiplayer in games and some that we have liked and what makes it good. And I specifically cited the example of Splinter Cell Chaos Theory because I've been really jonesing to find a way to play that. But I guess Ubisoft shut the servers down, which is a huge bummer. But that was, in my opinion, one of the best asymmetrical multiplayer games. It was four players, two spies and two mercs, mm -hmm. and you would go into these mm. maps and the spies had to hack terminals and the mercs had to basically stop them and shoot them and the way it was really interesting was that the spies played in third person stealth mode and your mercenaries played in first person mode and it's basically two different games yeah exactly that it's asymmetrical to the extreme and it had a lot of really interesting skillful elements like as a mercenary you know you could shoot a frag grenade into a vent mm -hmm and like hoop it and that felt really good and as a spy you could grab the mercenaries and break their necks so you had that moment of surprise and everything and I think it was asymmetrical multiplayer just done really well and there were all these weapons and gadgets and just mastering single maps took forever and what was particularly interesting is it's asymmetrical multiplayer but balanced in a way that doesn't involve numbers or something like that like if you look at maybe Starcraft where you have your different races and factions they're balanced on a a series of variables like how much damage a thing can do to another thing and this mm -hmm. didn't have that it was just abilities balanced against other abilities and the, it was tense it was so tense it was incredibly tense yeah and it was also when microphones were just becoming a thing on xbox live and you could whisper into the mercenaries ears before you snap their necks and <laughs> tell them that their hair smells great before you send them off into the great beyond it was just a really amazing game but it's also <laughs> really hard to get asymmetrical multiplayer right so i thought you know maybe we could yeah because both groups are at a disadvantage like like one group can do things that the others uh, others can't in a, in a pretty extreme way so it makes it really hard to balance, I guess, because you, you want asymmetrical games, but you don't want imbalanced games, because that's just not fun. Exactly, and when you tie it to that third variable of, you know, this comparing how they can do things against each other instead of being totally different, mm -hmm. you end up with something that can be a little bland in a way. And also require you and to, well, it, it just required you to have headphones because it, it was near impossible to do like, with just random people with no voice comms because you need to be able to coordinate what you're doing yeah oh absolutely that's very and true if one of you screws up then yeah you know, you're basically you're fucked yeah that's it and it was just it was so very unique and i haven't seen anything else like it in such a long time it's just it's fascinating and the assassin's creed games kind of got a little bit into the whole asymmetrical right. multiplayer thing too Ooh yes i, I love me some assassin's creed uh, and they, they introduced that deathmatch game mode in i think it was brotherhood and basically for the people who don't know um don't don't know about this mode you basically spawned uh, into a map that was full of npcs that looked like you and all the other players in the lobby 
and you sort of had to play cat and mouse to figure out which of the NPCs or which or which of the NPC lookalikes was actually a player, and you had to kill them. And I thought that that was amazing. It was really, really tense, especially when people were playing it right. Because, you know, the more stealthy your kill is, the more points you get. And there will always be people who will just run around the map and score like 150 point kills, which is probably the lowest you can get. Not only does it is it sort of anti-thematic for you, but it also, they're not going to end up winning. They're not getting enough points. And that, that was a bummer for me when I ended up playing that. Yeah. It, it was really good. You, you could you could get specific power ups, you know, to change into a different NPC for a, for a while. So the P, so the guy who had you as a target couldn't really find you because you didn't really look like you anymore. It 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 made for a lot of intense games. Plus the games were pretty short, usually around fifteen minutes, something like that. So it was pretty quick fire, and it was pretty frantic because you didn't have a lot of time to get a lot of kills in. And yeah, it was amazing. They they removed it in Unity, and I'm still salty about that to this day. Yeah, it was what was so clever about it was that you were trying to track somebody, but at the same time, somebody was always tracking you. Yeah, you're always looking over your shoulder. Yeah, it was so <laughs> tense, man. Or the time, like if you'd get it wrong and you'd stab somebody, and then you're like, oh crap, that was just an NPC, and then you know you're dead in the next ten seconds. Yes, because you're, you're exposed now by killing the wrong guy, and you can be certain that the guy who was hunting you saw that, and now you well, you have to run for your life and hope that you can get away in time. It's, <sighs> it's pretty cool. Another, another example of some good uh, asymmetrical are the things where you sort of have one player who controls the experience for the mass of the other players. There was a Half-Life mod called Zombie Master. And yeah. one player controlled the zombie master, and he would spawn the zombies and set traps and all these things, and everybody else was just a mass of people trying to get through that and get to him. Mm -hmm. Sounds interesting. And I think, um, yeah. I've never, pl I've never played that, actually. It was, it was kind of cool, and I think Natural Selection did the whole sort of thing better, but it's the same concept where there's one person who's a commander and they see top down mm -hmm. and they set up the first person experience for everybody else wasn't there an uh, an, an alien game as well that did that that one one person played the alien and the, and the rest played marines oh yeah yeah Evolve? aliens versus predator yep yeah <laughs> aliens versus predator was or, or yeah sure evolves the same right it's it's all asymmetrical oh, yeah yeah in a different way I don't know, I, I, I don't like that game, but I, I, I get the feeling, I played the beta and it was alright, I guess, but I get the feeling that I don't like that game because of the internet hate machine. So just as a short site, no, I don't want to really want to go into that right. now, but I don't know. It, it looked really promising, but like the game vanished as soon as it came I'm out. I'm kind of sad Pac-Man Versus is getting no love from you guys. Oh, Pac-Man Versus? Man. Dude, it was awesome! Is that the one with the GameCube yes! and the four Game Boys that you yes! Yeah, you okay? man! And every, you had the ghost? Yeah, yep. that's a good one. It was one. a five-player game. You had oh. to have like the Game Boy Advance and the link cables to play it because the whole concept was a f like one player would play as Pac-Man. You could see the entire map. But four of the players would actually play as the ghost. And the ghost had a limited field of view. So you can only ever see your ghost on the screen and where he's moving in the mini area. So, and then it just played like a regular Pac-Man game from then on out. So it was actually really cool. Oh, that sounds awesome. I never played Dude, that. It was awesome. But I mean, yeah. like, it was, it was kind of, it was really good. It was kind of convoluted to set up because, you know, like Sam said, you needed to have four Game Boy Advances with like the Link Cable and the GameCube to play it. But it was, dude, it was awesome. Link Cables, man. It was probably one of the first experiences <laughs> I had with like asymmetrical multiplayer. And it was actually a lot of fun. Yeah, that game was a hoot. It was a lot of fun. There's an arcade machine that's like Pac-Man versus now i think i saw it at dave and busters but you're it's just four pac-man on the same screen it's totally different oh man mm. it, yeah it's not as good at all yeah, i need to see if there's close, like an emulator for that and like somehow recreate it mm, i need to get myself a game boy advance <laughs> just fight, you need four fight this them. game yeah <laughs> but it's worth it <laughs> it's 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 a hoot and i remember it wasn't was it just like an extra game on the disc i think too, so because right? it, like, it was like on the, like uh, it came on one of the namco collections or something like that I don't think it was a yeah. It was like game. a side story when it should. They really buried the lead on that one. I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, but it was a lot of fun. I mean, that's when people mention isometrical multiplayer and the whole, you know, like f like four or five players. That's the first game that pops to mind because it was so, it was so simple, but it was so enjoyable. Mm. There's actually a new uh, a new game coming out. That is very asymmetrical, and that is um, Fable Legends. I'm curious about that. Can you tell me a little bit more? Um, well, it's four heroes. It's, five, it's a five-player game, four heroes in a team, and one is a villain. Each role may be filled by a player in uh, online multiplayer or by 
AI, basically. So the uh, the villain is basically a dungeon master. He decides where to spawn like creatures and stuff like that, spawn traps, and the four other players have to get through the le- through the level to beat him, basically. And I- I'm not entirely sure if this game's got a story or any or anything like that, but it's coming out on uh, Microsoft Windows. I'm thinking Windows 10 because it- I think it's a launch game for that. Great. And um, it's coming to the Xbox One as well, and it's cross-platform multiplayer really? as well. Really? Finally. That's good. Yes. More players is Finally. always a good thing. Yeah, uh, and, and it's going to be free to play as well. So you know, I don't fully trust Microsoft with pulling off a free to play game. But then again, you know, I'll reserve judgment for it actually comes out. But it seems interesting enough That's... to me. I, w- I would, I would, I would like to team up like for my my buddies and let a, another friend play the villain and and just play that because it seems. That sounds awesome a lot like me. that uh that D and D style game that's supposed to be coming out where you know you have four. It's like an ARPG where four players are the heroes, and then once the dungeon master that gets to set up where all the monsters and traps and stuff are. Hmm. That's a really difficult form of the one versus many form of asymmetrical multiplayer is really difficult to pull off. There's board games like that. Like there's a game called Descent where you have four heroes and one dungeon master. And when it's a competitive thing, it becomes very tricky. Everybody has to really know how to play their role. Mm hmm. Yeah. And then you have to obviously make the one person more powerful because they're playing against the many, but also not too powerful that it's really tricky to find that line. Yeah, it's going to be going to be hard to balance something like this. But you know, I've seen a couple of videos about this. I think um what was that YouTube series called? I think it's Extra Credits. They did a couple of videos videos on that, and it seems interesting enough. Like if, if you if you haven't seen it, go go watch it later after you, you you're done listening to the podcast. Uh, it seems interesting enough, and I'm always up for some asymmetrical multiplayer because I think it's something that is not used often enough, and more often than not, when it's actually used, it's not used well. So, for instance, um, in Destiny, the death matches there, they are asymmetrical, but you're kind of out of shit out of luck if your gun is less good than some other player. And I don't think that that is the right way to incorporate asymmetrical multiplayer because it's not fun. You, you get no chance of winning if someone else got a stronger gun than you have. So, yeah. But yeah, I'm looking forward to Fable Legends. Seems like something that is uh, relevant to my interests. So. Yeah, anything like that, man. One versus many is where it's at, but it's really hard to do. Hard to do right. Yeah, exactly. And in uh, and in the spirit of wanting to play more um, more Splinter Cell, uh, I'm I'm asking uh, Ubisoft to do a remaster of that and reopen the servers because I, I hope so. I want to play that. Yeah, yes. man. It's it was a product of its time and it was very unique and I've been nostalgic mm. for it for the last. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> for about in the past the last two week. in the in the past two years, well, if the past two years have, have been any indication, uh, Ubisoft likes money. U- Ubisoft likes easy money. So make this happen, because I will buy it, and I will play it with Samuel. Yeah, we will. (laughs) All right, well, this next topic uh, is kind of a summary of events that's happened in the past few days. Um, Back on April 23rd, Valve and Bethesda got together, and they instituted that paid mod model, which met with a lot of community uh, backlash to the point where even Gabe Newell had to go on Reddit and, you know, address some concerns. But... Lo and behold, it didn't last long since the paid mod actually got removed. But it kind of brings up the question because Valve had a really interesting, I guess, approach to it where they said that their mentality was they were looking at examples from games like DayZ and Dota 2 where they start off as mods and eventually the team got to a place where you know they could actually work on those projects full time and make them full games. So my question is, do you think that model is viable? And I mean, can these games and mods, for example, be paid to increase quality? Um, I, I think that money is definitely a factor. No, it, it could help to, uh, to to make mods more worthwhile and even put, uh, even make them into full games, basically. But I don't know. The the mod has to be exceptional in order to to you know, warrant a full release, basically. Well, see, and it's and it's weird because the way they were phrasing it was that. They felt that if you could give the modders the ability to monetize and get paid for their work, they could kind of devote, you know, full time to those mods and increase their quality. But what we ended up seeing was a lot of backlash. We saw a lot of modders not even wanting to charge for their work. 
we saw others just being lazy mm -hmm. and taking the easy way out. They'd steal someone else's work and post it up for a couple for some chump change. And it's interesting because when you look at games like Dota 2, for example, that's a free-to-play game. So I don't really think that qualifies the same model. And DayZ, it's it's a far from finished title, you know? Yeah, uh, I, I read this on, on the internet somewhere that um, the, the new Unreal Tournament is basically go, going to enable third parties to make mods and sell them on a marketplace. But yet, that is different than, for instance, Skyrim, because the new Unreal Tournament is set up from the get-go to be a free-to-play game. Mm -hmm. So there's no price of admission before you have to spend money for additional content, basically. So that makes it more or less okay. It's just the way that Valve and Bethesda were trying to do this that I've got issues with, because they, they'll just put stuff behind a paywall that they didn't make. Uh, it, it just seems unfair yeah. to, uh, to the end user. I guess you could sort of argue that their heart was in the right place, or at least that's the image that they're trying to convey, that their heart was in the right place. But I don't think they took enough time to look at the usage scenario and how people interact with mods. I think that it's a lot more free form. I think that people like to have 20, 30 mods installed, uninstall, reinstall, swip around, you know, move here and there. I want this now. Now I don't. And when you have to pay for each individual mod, that's not the way that I think something like that should be monetized. I think sort of the idea of paying creators is a good idea, but that's not the way to do it. I think they have to take a step back and charge for entry to the theme park instead of charging for individual rides. But I mean, and it also, it's, it's a weird setup because when you look at a game like Dota 2, you know, these people were taken you know, aside and said, hey, we want you to make this into a full-fledged game. We're going to pay you salary for this. Whereas Skyrim, I mean, these are individual mods. You know, they're not creating a game. They're just adding to the experience. So should, should they be charging for a couple hours of gameplay or for a couple of weapon skins? Weapon skins, definitely not. A couple of hours of gameplay, it's debatable because most official DLC is just a, an extra couple of hours of story or an extra couple of gameplay or, or maybe some new mechanics thrown into the mix for good measure. Uh, I don't know. But the, the number of hours that they put into that stuff, I don't know how you... Like, how do you equate the, the hours put in on something like a quest versus the hours put in modeling something like a weapon as far as what that's worth in actual monetary value? That's sort of a tricky question. Well, I, I think like weapon skins or extra weapons, I, I think they take less time to make than entirely new areas or new storylines, new quests, stuff like that. So I, I, I think like total conversion mods, for instance, I think those are, well, worth the money to play them. Weapon skins, mm, debatable. Right, they're a little more, they don't change as much and perhaps easier to make. I'm not sure, I've never actually modeled anything so i don't know how much effort is required to do something like that uh, my, my brother he works in design and he has dabbled in game design and, and making a model takes an insane amount of work especially if you want to do it properly so i'm, I'm not contesting that it it costs you less effort to make something like a weapon or something like that i'm just saying that they don't have as much of an impact on the game as a new map or a new quest line or, or or even a new fully voiced character with with his own storyline will i mean i mean so you're saying that i guess those people creating those weapon mods shouldn't get paid at all uh, it, it it it's it's tough it's the same amount of hours but it has in a way a less perceived value to the end consumer like you don't yeah. think you're getting as much out of it even though they're putting in you know a ton of work to make it but the effect on me and my game is less compared to something like a total conversion. So like when I'm right. voting with the money I want to spend as a consumer, that's what I see. Like how much is this going to impact my game? And then that sort of attributes an amount of money that I'm willing to spend. So do you think that model where, I don't know, like, I guess that model where you're, I guess they're actually actively charging for it as opposed to you donating money affects your perception of the quality of it? So let's say you have, you know, two mods side by side. You have, a, you know, a basic skin mod that adds a couple of different looking armors, things like that, versus, you know, another mod that adds about 20, 30 hours of gameplay. Um, you have a model where they're both free, you know, they're both free to download and you can donate. And then you have a model where the creators are actually charging for each one. Um, 
do you think in those scenarios one is worth more than the other or the quality differs that's see it's a different thing it's my perception of the value that changes not the actual quality of the object and what changes is the price that i'm willing to pay and i'm willing to pay less for a, a weapon skin or something like that yeah co cosmetics inherently seem to have a lower value to the end consumer and i mean that's the thing because that guy could have put you know a, a thousand hours into making that sword but to me as a person playing a game it just doesn't it's not as valuable mm. and to, to to um jump back to to the question is what monetization e equate to better quality i think yeah if if someone's salary is on on the line like if, if the sal salary hangs on their ability to create and maintain a certain level of quality in the content that they make and yes i think them getting paid would be beneficial to the work that they do because they've got a stake in it now it's true but it also moves the finish line or it moves the ultimate goal from being sort of something you make out of love to something that you make for a profit and that might introduce sort of a seedy element to it people who just make things to get the money out of it and you could oh, well, even be a create a drop in quality or a rush in of a large amount of lower quality things um i i i i think that you might be estimating the intelligence of the average consumer as too low because i don't know if, if, if you see a very lazily made the uh, mod somewhere like whether it be a new weapon or a weapon skin or even a skin for your player character and you see that's not that high quality would you actually pay for that i don't think you yeah would. that's true but i think it also because the way the model had you really had no way of telling the quality of it until you actually installed and ran the mod which was a big issue so even mods that looked like they were going to add a lot of content in terms of like oh you know new armor or new areas to explore and they could end up being broken jumbled messes but because of the system in play, mm. you, you really had no way of knowing until you tried it. And even at that point, true, you could get a refund, but you were banned from installing another mod for the next seven days. Oh, yeah, yeah, I saw yeah, that. Yeah, I think they're fixing uh, that. The, 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 whole, the whole way that they implemented this system it is just wrong. It, 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 and the way that they, um, like, they backtracked really quickly after they saw the backlash, which makes me think that they didn't really think this through before they them before they implement I mean, this because it is a very flawed system yeah and, and again i mean they were basing it off their success with you know ips like daisy and you know dota where they were games that started off as mods of other games and they're like hey you know if we can kind of adapt this paid model for creators it'll increase their quality which it didn't transfer well because you know partly and do because of the culture because you know people are used to the steam workshop mods they're free you know, it's everyone's working towards a common goal of, hey, you know, this is a fun experience. Let's see what else we can add. And it, like Sam was mm. saying, it creates this weird element where I guess you're almost putting the cart before the horse where you're paying these people in the hopes that they'll put together a fun mod or that they'll continue making a fun mod. Yeah, he, here's the thing, though. They're, they're not, well, they are paying them, but they're paying them peanuts. Like, a, a well, actually, I take that back. In, in they're the, not paying them. We're paying them. Well, well yeah. Yeah, we're, we're, we're paying Bethesda and they give a very small amount of, of the earnings to the actual content creator. And I don't think that that's a positive thing at all. It's not. But it, just to touch on what you were saying before for a minute is that if the paywall is behind individual mods, even though we are discerning consumers and, you know, we're not going to download the things that are bad and of low quality... It, the marketplace is still going to get flooded with a del deluge of stuff that's, you know, awful or scams or, you know, low rate. And then now all that has to be sorted and filtered to push it out. I think you see a lot of that with some mobile app stores and stuff like that. And so yeah. to avoid that, I just I don't think I think that was their big mistake was putting the paywall behind the individual mods. It needs to be like one level up. It needs to be the paywall should be for workshop access. I think that that takes all the problems away from your, you know, copyright claims and this doesn't work and broken things and all the support issues and refunds. Mm. Oh yeah, the the DMCA claims that that people got on the store that that was like everybody saw that one coming and I I just wonder how how Valve 
couldn't see that coming. Like some random person uploaded some some mod that he did not make, and it was based off of copyrighted content to the workshop and, and charges money for it. I mean, th th this is copyright 101. You just don't do that. And you have to make sure that you've created an environment that makes it harder for people to, uh, well, to infringe on, on copyright. And they haven't done that. You'd think they'd have a, a pile of usage statistics, right? For everybody that had Skyrim and how they've interacted with the workshop and what they've done with the tools available to them. Oh, yeah, they do because they are they are, are, are data-driven. That's company. what you would think, you but you'd think if you were looking at that data that they would see that this model is just not going to work because people install 100 mods from the workshop, you know? They're mm -hmm. not going to spend $100 and they don't have that many trading cards to sell to buy that many mods. And that they change around all the time, that people subscribe and unsubscribe from things at a, at a huge rate. I think Bethesda just wanted to do this because they're, they're, they're done selling their game by now. I mean, the game is like three or four years mm -hmm. old now. And they see that people are still making content for it. People are still actively engaging with that third party content. And they just wanted a piece of the pie. And the only way they could think of doing that was via doing this. This is, of, of course, just... I mean, what I think, it doesn't have to be this way, but it seems the most logical reason why this came out of the blue. You know, you do raise an interesting point, though, because um, for all the talk they said about, you know, they want to encourage and reward modders for their creations, this wasn't being done out of their own pocket. You know, they were making it so the community was the one that was going to have to flip the bill for this, and they were getting a profit out of it as well. Mm. So uh, they're getting the biggest part of the, pro of the profit. That is the most unfair thing. This is not good for modders. Like 25% of the earnings is not good for modders. That is good for Bethesda. Valve gets 30 and the modder gets 25% and Bethesda gets the rest. That's not fair towards the modders at all. So I don't, I don't see how this could have been a positive thing for modders. Yeah, it seemed a little disingenuous for them to say, hey, we want to reward modders, but we're going to do so after we take our cut and we'll give you whatever's left over. Yeah. We're first going to reward ourselves, and then we're going to let you share in that for a little bit. But, I mean, there's definitely some merit in this, because um, even in the statement that uh, I think Eric made on a PC, was it PC Master Race and a couple of the other subreddits, um, they, Valve still mentions, hey, um, we think there's something here. Obviously, implementing it in Skyrim that has an established user base was a bad idea, but we're not giving up on this yet. Oh, no, they shouldn't. They should figure figure out a way to to pay content creators fairly, because I think that they should be paid. Content is not free, and uh, in, an, in an art form like video games, ex the things that people make for those video games, there's a lot of work hours that are going into that. And they should be compensated for that, but not this way. This this was this was a failed experiment, and it was it was a needless experiment. I think you're right. I think experiment is the key word here. I mean, at least looking at it from Bethesda's perspective, they all the copies of Skyrim that sold only eleven percent of them were sold on the PC. So I th I think that at least as far as monetization, their goal wasn't to make a bunch of money on Skyrim mods. Their goal was to make a bunch of money on fallout 4 mods or whatever the next you know elder scrolls game is mods and they just wanted to see if it was viable and hopefully they've been shown that uh, in the current iteration it is not ah so th th this might be a way for bethesda to just get a bit more revenue out of the pc market. i think they were dipping their toe in the water i think they wanted to see you know sort of what might happen if you were looking at it from bethesda's perspective because the bulk of the money that they make on that game you know, was not the PC market. Yeah. Well, and see, right. as a consumer, I I might get crucified for this, but I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing because I'm also thinking about long-term where let's say that Bethesda and Valve managed to find the sweet spot where, you know, the consumers are okay with paying for access to mods for existing games. Mm. I feel like I kind of set a precedent for other companies where normally they have like these closed system games that you're not allowed to touch whatsoever they can suddenly make their games more open source because they want to kind of get in on that profit. That wouldn't be the worst thing. I'd, I'd be willing to spend small amounts of money on mods if it would create more of a situation like that where more people were making mods and better mods and games that didn't have them previously now had them. But I think the result of this experiment is that this isn't the way to do it. 
Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't have a problem with paying for mods if it was fair towards one, the end user, so us basically, and the content creator. That If it was fair to those two parties, then I would be absolutely okay with it. I'm sorry, what kind of model would you like? Uh, would you prefer a more donation thing where you as a consumer could decide how much you want to give them? Or yes. some kind of subscription model? Um, both would be equally valid, I think. Like, um, donations would be friendlier towards the end user because you don't really have to pay. But if you really like a mod and you use it often, you should have the option to pay the modder directly. And a subscription thing will be all right as well. But the the price the price per month would have to be pretty low for that to work. I don't even think it's a per month thing. I think you have to combine them into a sort of weird Frankenstein beast because the donations on their own, I don't believe are going to be as effective as people are shouting about them being. And the subscription mm -hmm. thing every month is also not good because if you don't play the game, you know, for many months and you have to remember to cancel your subscription, I think it should just be a one-time fee. Like $10 yeah, gets you, be best. you can download 20 mods at the same time. And if one of them breaks, you just uninstall yeah. it, you switch to a different one and then that's fine and then you could pay twenty dollars and get unlimited mods forever and the key is the the way the donation part comes in would be that that price of a ticket would then translate to a certain amount of gems or something you could spend only in that workshop for tipping mod creators so that they they could uh -huh. get paid because there's nothing else you could do with those and then also valve and bethesda get paid and we as consumers don't feel exploited and i think that might be a good compromise yeah uh, i think that that would be a good idea. Just to, just pay once, get access to everything. Uh, w would you want to see that for all games, or you have to pay per game? I guess it would have to be on an individual game basis because of the way the publisher mm. cut shakes out. If the, if there ah, was a game yeah. that you know you wanted to mod from a different publisher, you couldn't just pay for Workshop for everything. I don't think. But I mean, it's going to be something like that. I think that the way things are like they're starting to test the waters of changing this and that we can never go home again like we're never going to be go back to totally free mods all over the place it's going to be something different if nothing else it's uh, going to be a tonal shift because people know that this did happen at some point in the past and well, it's not oh no sorry, sorry go, go ahead. ahead no no i insist <laughs> no i say just to piggyback on that i mean and it's going to happen like you mentioned the new quake game is going to rely on that microtransaction for user made mods so uh, unreal. But yeah. Sorry, yeah, unreal. And it, this is in, inevitable. Like it's going to happen. This is just, I guess we saw kind of the, almost the worst case scenario of what it could be when it's implemented incorrectly. Mm. Well, I, th I think the way that, that the guys behind unreal are uh, epic, I think. Yes. Yeah. I, I think that they're going about this the right way. Th their game is free to play, but third party content costs money. And that is the way how they are going to make money. Which is a bit fairer, I think, because there's no price of admission to the base game. You can play that for how long you want, how often you yeah, want. Yeah, sure. But if you if you want more, pay. And that content is made by other people, other people just like you. So yeah, you'll be financing other modders to keep on doing what what they're doing. But you didn't have to shell out initially to play that. Yeah, game. that doesn't seem it's too just, bad. Yeah, just if you want more. You can buy more, but you don't have to, and that gives you gives you the consumer choice, and choice is important. It's very important. But this is the, you know, this is the start of something. They're going to push, and consumers are going to push back, and then they're going to push a different way, and we're going to push back, and eventually, it's just yeah. going to settle out somewhere in the middle with something everybody's happy with. But we just got to go through those motions of building and destroying yeah. before we find something that works for everybody because i agree with them i think that there is a model out there that everybody can be happy with yeah and j j just just so we're clear none of us are are against the idea of mods costing money but we're all against the idea of how they are trying to monetize their content now because it's just not fair yeah, i think people should people should get paid I've, I've played some really really fun mods and i've made donations and you know whatever there's People should be paid for what they do, because some of yeah, that stuff is not. really rad, and it's worth spending money for. Yeah, I've been playing um like XCOM. There's the Long War mod, which is fantastic, and it almost makes it feel like a whole separate game on its own. And 
you know, oftentimes you find that a lot of these bigger mods, they proceed at a slower pace than you wish because simply these people have, you know, real life obligations. And if we can somehow soften the financial blow they take by, you know, investing more time in their projects, I mean, I'm all for it. That's yeah. the thing is that those mods have had donation buttons forever, and but they're still suffer from that issue of lack of financial flow where they have to do their real life stuff. So we, we either need a social consciousness shift where everybody becomes more willing to spend money on these things, or we need a, a soft hand to push people in the direction of spending money or donating. Hmm. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'll be interested to see where this is going. Like what, what, what the state of this particular situation would be in like a year or two. Something's going to change, well, that's for sure. It's definitely oh, coming. Oh, yeah. B because of this, we will probably never be able to go back to the way things were. And it, it, it might be for the better, it might be for the worse. I don't, I don't know yet, but I think it's, it's interesting. Yeah, I think as long as the community still has an option, we'll be able to find a nice middle ground. You know, as long as yeah. you're not told that you have to pay for these mods and that's the only way you'll get access to them, or as long as the community is not told that, you know, they, it's either one way or the highway, um, as long as you give the community a choice in how these things are carried out, I think we can at least give a little bit of leeway. All right, um, that's about all we have time for for today, but drop us a line, uh, look in the description below uh, the podcast if you want to send us a message or you want to follow us on twitter you want to follow us on facebook or whatever we'll be doing this weekly this was a sort of yeah pilot episode and we would really like to know what you guys thought of it what what would you like to see in this podcast what what did you like what did you like just drop us a line so check the description and you'll see everything that you need to send us a message and to contact us directly basically so from uh, all of us here at select characters thank you so much for listening and um we'll see you next week bye bye thanks Later. guys